So we've seen that to understand this uh, corona of the sun, we're going to have to go into magnetohydrodynamics, the insanely complicated business of where you get plasmas and magnetic fields playing their complicated dance backwards and forwards. Now, generally, this whole field scares astronomers silly, sillier. So I thought I'd actually uh, talk to someone who does this for a living. So welcome back, Cormac. We talked to you earlier about uh, fusion, but you're actually kind of a plasma scientist by default. So tell me, what actually is a plasma? Uh, thank you for having me back. Um, so a plasma is often termed the fourth state of matter. So if we consider we have solid, liquid, and gas, and then the fourth state is the plasma state. So as an example, if we um, look at water, water can exist in a solid state as ice, if we apply some energy or heat to the ice, we're going to get the liquid state, so we get water. And if we apply some more heat and energy to that liquid, we're going to get the gaseous state. Now, whenever we apply more heat and energy to the gas, what we do is we rip electrons off an atom. So what's left behind then is a positive ion and an electron. And this is the plasma state. So the plasma state is a soup of charged particles, um, of electrons and uh, ions, and also some neutral particles. Now, for astronomers, plasmas are painful. But you've chosen to spend your life studying these things. What is it about plasmas that got you interested and made you choose this field? Well, one of the things about plasmas is back... Plasmas have driven the microelectronic industry, for example. So back in the 70s, uh, integrated chips were primarily manufactured using chemical means. Until plasmas came along. And back in the 70s, the, the, the computers were essentially the size of your home. That was your home computer. And because of plasma technology and the ways that it can interact with materials, we've got much smaller computers. We've got laptops. We've got mobile phones. Um, so that was one of my first interests, if you like, in, uh, into plasma um, physics. So can you show us the plasma? I'd love to. It's, it's one of the things uh, I enjoy doing in my job. So here is the Magpie device. It's, uh, if you like, named after an Australian bird, and it stands for Magnetized Plasma Interaction Experiment. Okay. And essentially what we have here, at this end, we've got some vacuum pumps. So what we want that's to do... That's the noise we're hearing. That's the noise that we're hearing. What we want to do is remove any gas inside there. So we've got a very, very low vacuum, about a billionth of an atmosphere, if not more. Just still a lot more than the density of space, but... Exactly, that's right. And what we do is at one end, we flow some gas in, and in this region here, it's called the source region. We have a, if you like, a copper antenna or copper wire surrounding a glass tube to which we apply radio frequency waves. And this enables us to create our plasma. And I'll turn it on in a second, but we also have some coils here. And if we flow a current through these coils, we create a magnetic field. So it becomes very, uh, a very complex environment because, of course, the plasma itself can generate its own magnetic fields and electric fields, and uh, it becomes very, quite a difficult fluid, if you like, to study. So here we go. I've got some gas in there already. I'm going to apply some power to the antenna, and here we have our plasma discharge. Okay, and it's glowing uh, pink. That's some sort of emission lines we're seeing that give it the pink color. That's correct. So this, this is an argon plasma, and the emission lines um, under these conditions are typically around 750 to just over 800 nanometers. So that's about what the human eye perceives as purple. That's correct, that's correct. And, and actually, if we put more power into it, it can actually go blue because we see some, of, some lines being emitted from excited ions, and that's around 480 nanometers. So it's presumably pulling the electrons up to higher energy levels because of the higher, so they um, might be jumping from level four to three rather than one to two or something like that. That's correct, that's correct. Um, and as an example, if I, if I, if I change the power here, when I decrease the power, we'll see that it gets dimmer and goes out. And if I increase it, we see it gets brighter. So we're putting more energy into the plasma, creating a higher plasma density, controlling uh, what is happening. So what is the main research you're doing with this apparatus? So Magpie was developed in order to simulate what happens at the plasma wall interaction region of a tokamak. So, so again, it's the fusion we were talking about the, in our previous video. That's correct. So what I would do is I would put some tungsten. Tungsten is a key material for the eater tokamak. We put tungsten samples in here, we bombard it with the plasma, and then we study what happens to the material afterwards. So one example is here we've got a tungsten surface which has got some blistering. Now the melting temperature for, for tungsten is 
3,400 degrees Celsius or thereabouts. So here we can see that we're actually causing. That's why it's a used lot in lamps, so they can get very hot when it's it very hot when it melts. So we study um, those pl the plasma material interaction processes for fusion reactors. We have also applied this process because we can do very nice structuring, nanostructuring of the surface. We've also applied it to silicon and germanium uh, for applications in solar cells, for example, or photovoltaics. So you'd actually use a plasma to build a solar cell? We, we would look at the materials that could be put into a solar cell, for example. Okay, so it's not actually building the solar cells, it's a bit big to, exactly. to do the plasma, but you'd actually use it to investigate new and different and better materials that could go into future solar cells. That's correct, that's correct. What are the other major uh, applications of plasmas now? You've talked about by far the most major, which is building semiconductors. So, uh, yeah, that's right. So semiconductors has been uh, a huge area for, for quite a long time, for about 50 odd years. Um, other applications, and uh, some of my research is linked to plasma propulsion, for example. So developing new propulsion concepts for satellite systems in space to improve maneuverability of the satellite systems. We'll talk about that in the space section of the course, but oh, basically instead of firing rocket fuel out the back, you would fire a plasma out the back at a much higher speed, but much smaller amount of material. That's correct, that's correct. So we, we, we use the, the um, uh, high temperature environment, if you like, to produce that thrust, that, to propel the spacecraft forward. We also use it in some other applications that I use it for, is for waste management. So for example, we can use a plasma in the form of a torch to treat harmful gases that are being produced in the waste industry through the burning of plastics or uh, the burning of other materials. So we could produce, if you like, a, a methanol or an ethanol, a syngas. We can also capture, turn it into a hydrogen for a future hydrogen economy. Um, another uh, application of plasmas is towards uh, sterilization of surfaces. Because in a plasma, we produce not only electrons and ions and those charged particles, but we produce uh, ultraviolet radiation. We also produce very reactive uh, species like uh, oxygen, nitrogen, which can interact with surfaces, let's say in the me medical industry, um, and it can sterilize uh, those surfaces. So there are many applications of plasma. And one really cool recent experiment I did was to use plasmas to treat uh, seeds to try and enhance the germination phase of those seeds so that they grow faster, grow healthier, and can fight bacteria. Thank you very much. So this is one of the reasons why I'm very interested in plasmas.